All right. Hi, I'm Mona. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a software developer by background. Um, I started my career as a full stack developer in with Morgan Stanley, so in investment banking and finance, essentially. And over the years, I've uh, taken on various roles to build platform products. Um, my current role is um, that Roger, of a I need your phone. I need yeah. at uh, Zoa. It's an energy tech startup. Um, we are. Uh, our mission is to power the energy transition uh, through brilliant consumer experiences. So I'm excited about working on something that actually makes a difference um, and helps, you know, stop climate change. That's a bit about me. Rajni, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Mono. Uh, I was saying that it's the second time you've been on uh, my panel. So, you know, welcome back. And I'm uh, pleased that you're here and you can join us. Megan, you're next. Could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Yeah, awesome. I'm Megan. I'm happy to be here. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am based in Chicago, Illinois, in the U.S. And I am coming here after a career. My background's in cognitive neuroscience. I was turned data scientist, where I was a VP of data science at Nielsen for about 10 years. And now throughout that experience, I became super fascinated about the challenges for associates as they go about their journeys in coding. I got to oversee the creation of a data lake. Um, the first one was a failure, like going through all of that. And so I'm currently head of research uh, for associate experiences for the enterprise solutions at Capital One, where we are working to uncover and identify those situations on platforms, products, and technology that our associates are using to build kind of the future data infrastructure um, in banking. Uh, throughout my career, I also developed a passion for coaching and developing the leaders of tomorrow and have uh, got my coaching certification earlier and also work as a executive and leadership coach um, on the side. Thank you, Megan. And um, I know Megan through this leadership coaching, so that's how I met her. And uh, yourself, Nick, is the um, hi, Rajni. Hi, everyone. This is Nikita. Um, I'm currently running my own startup called CareerFlow.ai, uh, where we are helping folks through AI in their career. Before that, I started my career as a software engineer. Then I became a data analyst. And three years back, actually, I turned my career into recruitment. So I was working as a senior technical recruitment with companies like Amazon as well as Uber. And I'm also currently a content creator with 200K plus social media followers. So I talk to job seekers on day-to-day -day basis, happy to be here sharing some tips and tricks around interviews. And if anyone has any questions, happy to answer that. Thank you, Nikita. I have seen all your LinkedIn posts and I and I follow you and um, you know the amazing stuff you do for uh, women in tech. Thank you. Thank you, Rajni. Uh, uh, Simon, Simon, and um, myself, we were we were colleagues in the past, and uh, we both have decided. In fact, today was my last day in New Blocks. I'm, uh, you know, joining another company, but not long ago, Simon was uh, uh, my colleague in New Blocks as well. So Simon, I welcome you to introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rajani, and uh, thanks, folks, for for having me um, on your panel on your panel today. Um, so yeah, I'm Simon. I'm, I'm principal uh, engineer at uh, HiveMQ. Um, I um, also have a, around 20 years um, experience in the industry, um, having been principal for about eight years or so. Um, I've taken startups from startup right the way through as co-founder to acquisition twice. Um, and um, I've worked for the likes of Qualcomm, Ublocks, and now I'm at the exciting company called HiveMQ, um, who are an IoT-based MQTT platform. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of passionate about um, uh, growing the uh, engineering dynamics and the, the team dynamics of the engineering team um, and uh, sort of encouraging that potential to shine through. So thanks for having me on the panel. Thank you, Simon. It's uh, uh, and we have our last panelist here, um, Lisa. Lisa, and please feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm 
currently a web engineer at Spotify, and uh, I started my career as a, a machine learning engineer and uh, worked really hard to secure some internships like at Google or CERN or the companies. And uh, I've been through a lot of interviews and <laughs> ups and downs. And uh, finally, I'm really doing what I'm passionate about. I've also recently started to be a mentor for women to also uh, start or continue their career at tech. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, I will not waste my time and I'll quickly ask you questions. I just want to uh, let you know that my laptop has failed because it's lost battery and my charger has gone kaput. So we are, uh, you know, I've improvised and we're doing it while I'm at phone just in case you wonder what is going on. Um, sorry about that, but can't be helped. Um, so my first question to all the panelists, actually, because I'd like to see how each one um, looks at the whole interviewing and interviewing preparation, because we have like difference and we have a diverse panelist here. So I'd like to pose this question to all you panelists. What would be your 30 day um, uh, blueprint for interview prep uh, for, for a technical round? So what would you all do if we only if, say, I was going for an interview and I had only 30 days to prep for it? What would uh, be your blueprint? Um, I'm happy for anyone to start. Feel free to yeah take the mic. Simon, you're muted. You can go um, first. Yeah, I'm indeed muted. I'm, I'm happy to start with Johnny. Um, yeah, this, go for it. This is a, a, a cool problem, a, a cool question. So um, there are some fundamentals that that you just have to have to be in place, right? So, you you know, if you're going for a, a deep tech role, then you need to understand your algorithms, your data structures, your time complexities, all that stuff. They're, they're sort of must haves right so you've just you've just got to do that stuff and so get that stuff out of the way early um ensure you're confident with it do the reading in and around it ensure you've read some good books and there are some fantastic books out there and, and i'm sure folks would be happy to record from the panel will be happy to rend, recommend their favorite books um i i sure as heck have got got my favorites that that have been on my book bookshelf for for 25 years at least and i keep going back to them even now so um yeah, read read those books, and so that just get those fundamentals out of the way because you, you're going to need those. Um, but then, as you're getting closer towards the the interview date, ensure you start looking at the the sort of secondary points of the of the interview. So beyond beyond the the technical must have, start to understand the business, the context within the which the business works. Um, get an understanding of of their core principles and philosophies. Um, Typically, a, a, a company will be aligned to a, a, a set of business principles um, and things that they are con they consider themselves passionate about. So whether that's community um, or sustainability and ensure you have an understanding and you can talk to that during the interview process. Um, and so that that's when you're coming right up to the interview process because you you want that top of mind because the, the, those softer softer questions are going to be are going to be just as important as the as the hard do you know this or do you not know that, um, and then of course invariably there'll probably be some sort of take home assignment as well I I would imagine um, in most technical roles. Um, and ensure you're prepared to to invest the time in that take home assignment and don't think of it by the way as a chore. Um, some people will think of it as like homework or something. Oh, do I have to do? Don't think of it like that. This th think of it as an opportunity. So any take home assignment you've got, it's it's an opportunity to, for you to express your capabilities and, and showcase your skill set. So show off during that process. Right. So if you're going to do write an algorithm, make sure you write it tight. Make sure you write it um, with all the princ core principles in mind and annotate and comment, uh, show you understand why you've done something and be prepared to demonstrate that in your code or in your in your documentation. Um, because what what I'm certainly looking for is not necessarily, um, you know, have I 
solved the problem it's the way in which you've solved it do you understand the problem do you understand the 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 techniques you've used to 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 solve that problem um so uh so yeah that would be that would be sort of my 30 days there's plenty to think about there's plenty of different types of research to be doing and prep work um and then ensure you don't do much on the last day just relax and and go into that process in a relaxed confident mood so i think that'd be it from me Rajani. thank you simon um yeah i'll yeah, megan okay. I'll, I'll totally chime in so i love what simon um had mentioned i think in terms of you know really preparing for that background understanding what you should be absorbing is just doing a really great job with your job research so looking at the job descriptions pulling out all of those keywords and understanding where your personal strengths are and where your gaps might be so you can really kind of focus in on like, what are those resources that I should be brushing up on and getting solid on? Um, and then I think another, th there's typically a take home, right? assessment. Um, there could be live coding examples, right? So you might be on a call with somebody where somebody is um, has asked you to solve something and they're watching you go through the thinking process, the coding process, making errors, doing all of those things. And then there's also, um, there may be opportunities for you to review examples of code or models and provide your own critique that you're doing live there, right? To me, one of the biggest challenges there is just getting comfortable with somebody else watching you do your work. And so identify in your for in those 30 days leading up, who's in your network who can hop on a Zoom call with you and watch you think through a problem, watch you code through a problem, probe and ask you questions so you get comfortable with that uncomfortable interaction. Um, and then also developing your own question bank. So uh, it is when you go through the interview process, you also get the opportunity to interview the company. You need to make sure that it's not only something that you're interested in, but you're also a good fit for. Um, so working in those thir first 30 days to really develop your question bank and what you might want to ask those interviewers. Um, the other really great opportunity you have is to network with anybody else who has worked at that company, been in a similar role and can give you some feedback on like, this is what you can probably expect. This is the culture that you'd expect. This is where I got hiccups. All of that stuff can help you prepare to go in to just absolutely kick it out of the park um, once you get there. Thank you, uh, Megan. I just wanted to say that um, I like the uh, interview pre preparation and the and the questions. Um, so I um, I truly believe that anything that's uncomfortable, the more you do it, you get comfortable with it, and then you become an expert. So um, I think the next two weeks we've uh, organized um, to uh, a, a tech round and a, a behavioral round of interviews. Um, so, and there are volunteers who will be actually conducting these rounds, which will really help. And this is a chance for others to come and benefit from this as well. So thank you for, um, yeah, yes, yeah I, I, love, yeah. I love that. Thank you. And Nikita, yourself. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to add as a recruiter, I think as a recruiter or HR person representing the company or having the first call, you should actually go back to them and understand the process. Like every recruiter who is actually reaching out to you, taking the first call, they know the process. They know how many rounds are going to be there, whether your first round going to be data structure round, whether you have system design and they're actually having like a proper like an interview kit, which every company do provide with the candidates, because I used to send the candidates those emails. And that is something like a first roadmap to sit back and understand this is the expectation. These are the rounds. If you have an on-site like one day round with back-to-back -back four rounds, just think about it that should I need to do it in one day? Should I divide it into two days or three days? And then on top of it, try to also check out um, websites like Blind. I don't know if everyone knows this or not, but they are like where you can go and just post that, hey, I have an upcoming interviews. And they will actually start sharing with you their own experiences that these are type of the questions you can expect, like practice lead code or practice more system design. And if you're practicing data structures, then these are the things. So try to also get as many data points collected from different uh, websites. Just don't rely on Glassador because I've seen people going back to Glassador and just checking it out. So try to collect as many data points as you can and then try to roadmap it, make up proper Excel, document it and then work on it. Because if you are just 
going through 100 different books, 100 different websites and together in 30 days because 30 days will pass away like very quickly. So take a step back and just do that roadmap and try to think that will 30 days will be enough for me or if not, then you can go back to your recruiters and be like, I need more time because these type of technical interviews take time and a lot of candidates used to come back. In fact, I used to tell them that take your time. There's no hurry because if you make a hurry and you're not able to clear it, then it's not making sense. So just a quick advice on that. Thank you, Nikita. That was one useful um, advice. Um, yeah, everyone, did you, did you hear that? That you can go back and change your interview process to suit you. I've uh, done that in the past. So yeah, and they are quite flexible because they also want to hire you and they're looking for uh, like good candidates. So uh, the companies are usually very flexible. Um, yeah. And uh, Lisa, would you like to, um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, I totally agree uh, with uh, uh, all the speakers. And uh, I also think that it's really important uh, for the behavioral interview to prepare some cases uh, in advance. Uh, also for non-native speakers like me, it was really important to prepare some texts so I don't think it's on spot like most of the time. Uh, also, as an engineer, um, actually, I don't have much like cases uh, integrating with other people or like a lot of um, soft skills cases. So uh, I really wanted to like <laughs> Google it in advance. And uh, even though I didn't have uh, that kind of situations uh, I would have something to speak about um, so yeah and uh, there are a lot of techniques like star or others uh, which I also used so yeah yeah star is one um, important aspect thank you everyone I think I've covered you um, all um, uh, thank you for that I have my next question it's about uh, technical mastery right so when we all go into the competency trap, as I call it, where we are over preparing and preparing and we are like, yeah, just, just lost the plot. We are always preparing our technical um, side of things. And if we so what what as like uh, as um, as candidates yourself or interviewers, what do you think uh, candidates usually under prepare? Um, Nikita, you you'd be a very good um, you know person to answer that, especially when you're HR. But I yep. know um, everybody else is interviewed person, so they will all have different mm -hmm. um, answers to this. So where do you think can candidates under prepare, and where yep. where should be they uh, focusing their efforts? Yeah, I think the most important thing is first of all prepare your own resume. <laughs> because that's where the interview starts. So that's the first thing any interviewer, whether they're recruiter or hiring manager, they will start with that one piece of paper and they will look at it like what type of projects have you done? What is your experience? What is your tech stack? And actually how they are related to the job description or the roles they are hiring for. So a lot of like majority of times, I, I should not say a lot of times, majority of the times candidates used to be like something else written in the resume. And when I used to ask them, hey, can you share with me this experience? They used to be like, okay, it's written. And somewhere I felt that they have just written it as a keyword. So don't do that mistake because if you're doing it, when you go into the interview rounds, within first few seconds, we understand that what's happening here. So try to like absorb as much as you can and know each and everything what you're writing and then mm. go from there in terms of preparing your technical part of it because that's where the whole interview starts and then they're deep diving about each of the things mentioned in the resume. Excellent. Thank you, Nikita. Um, I call on Mono, Simon, Megan, and Lisa. <laughs> I think I would, uh, you mentioned that people don't prepare enough for behavioral interviews. I would second that. I think that there's a lot that you can find out and do even in 30 days or more for technical interviews. But for the behavioral ones, it took me a very long time to even understand how to apply the STAR met method, which is basically like your situation, task, you know, what are the action and what was the result? And I would say, I, I would recommend taking at least a good week out of those 30 days just to write lots of different situations and, and just actually write down in that format, S T A R, what what would how would you answer behavioral questions? Um, you can find a lot of them. Um, there are also uh, websites now that you can use to practice them. 
with others. Um, one of them that I know of is like is Pramp, or the other one is interviewing.io. There's there's a few of them now um, that help you practice interviews as well. And and I would recommend practicing behavioral interviews with others um, in your network or 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 using one of these websites I mentioned to do that because it is a lot harder than it seems if you are not used to them. Thank you, Mono. I think uh, to add to that, um, the, the first question, tell me about yourself, right? Um, I feel uh, generally candidates underprepare for tell me about yourself because either they go like in length. Um, so I'd like to use tell me about yourself as a pitch perfect uh, thing that you're comfortable, uh, you know, sharing about yourself and being confident. And um, it's your first you know, few minutes to make an impression. So it's a very critical one. So I often find that when I'm interviewing, tell me about yourself, they they literally read off their resume versus, um, yeah. So I think there that, that would be really good if you could, um, yeah, uh, like prepare the tell me about yourself, which I think is, yeah, somewhat close to behavioral um, uh, interviews, a sort of question. It's not technical, but yeah. Uh, Megan? Yeah, so I think from a technical perspective, what I've seen is most people who are who have gotten to that point are getting some type of technical take home assessment and the majority of them will pass to a certain degree. If you've failed, it's typically either it was a very bad fit to begin with, there was some misalignment with the resume and the screening criteria or something drastic happened. We all have moments where we completely freeze and we're not able to do what it might be. The other piece I kind of alluded to before was when you're doing kind of those live exams where you're walking through and trying to show your reasoning, um, being able to articulate either in the code that you're writing through comments or um, as you're doing, I think aloud or critiquing other items, those are really pieces where you start to see where people get a little bit more uncomfortable from at least the technical perspective. Um, I agree with what everybody said about behavioral and I think we'll get into that, but technically most people I've seen show up, they get it. The, uh, one of the key things I think to remember is at least in my experience, we give a gamut of technical questions. We expect based on a level that you are not going to get them all. Right. Very rarely do we, in my experience, has anybody aced all of the technical questions that we've given them. The goal is to see how they actually fail and how they try to troubleshoot through some of those problems. Um, and so that mindset piece of being like, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to comment. And if I get stuck, I'm going to explain why I got stuck and where I'm at so I can come back to that if I've got time. Um, so really just getting in the mindset of understanding, like, I don't have to solve every single thing perfectly. And that it is more about being able to demonstrate my thought process. Because at the end of the day, when you're on a team and you're solving these problems, you are not going to solve every single problem that the company has to offer. You're going to have to work with other people. Um, and so that is like the key piece when people do the thing, but we opt not to go with them. It's because of that not showing your work piece. Lisa? Yeah, I would also like to add a comment about like when I think about the interview, uh, the first things uh, that come to mind is like algorithms, behavioral things and like research about the company. But uh, I tend to forget that there are things like they can ask you like system design or foundation stuff about the language or like advanced things or database stuff, like a lot of things all around. And uh I think uh, candidates tend to forget that there are also interviews about that and they also matter like uh, equally. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. The next question I have is um, how do you like beyond technical knowledge, right? So you can be confident technically, you, you, you know, you've been doing this for a few years, you've been solving lead code and you're, you're good technically and you know it. But how do you mentally prepare yourself to give your very best in the interviews so you appear confident and you feel confident? 
there's uh, clarity and there's energy, right? And uh, passion and enthousi enthusiasm. So are there any ticks? Because there are some days where I wake up and I'm like, oh, today is not my day. And if I had my interview, I'd be like, oh, God. So um, well, how, how, what are the techniques that you, you can think about or used or um, can recommend the audience on how to uh, how to be confident, how to have that clarity uh, in thinking and how do you uh, answer this, those questions with, you know, a good mindset? Anyone? Simon, there you go. Yeah. Sure, sure. I can come in on that, that Rajani. Um, so beyond the technical stuff, beyond the behavioral, like I would want to... Uh, if I'm speaking to a candidate, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of want to be looking for the fact that if they know beyond the business, potentially the context in which the, the business works, for example, um, the, the 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 trends that are going on within the industry that and the, the challenges that the business therefore face and therefore the team by definition may also face. So let's take an example of something like digital transformation. It's a it's a fairly broad topic, but it's a challenge that most businesses are facing. Right. And so having an understanding of that beyond the business and so you're showing an appreciation of the business landscape and the technical landscape within which you're working i think that's really important to have in place thank you simon lisa uh, oh Nikita, yeah yeah i can add one thing quickly so when someone is applying for any job as a job seeker um i don't know i know that you would you don't know like what is the process actually happening on the back end uh so for any job description and i think since covid happened minimum 100 to 200 applicants are coming for any job description and if you are getting an interview call and if your interview is getting scheduled or even recruiter is calling you you are standing out in the crowd so i think that is one thing which you need to have a confidence that if you are standing out in the crowd you're getting an interview call your interview is picking up your profile is picking up that is like a first indication that you are really really good at it right you are you have already skipped that part and uh, now people are calling you, showing confidence in you. And that company actually believes that you can be selected as one of the employees in their company. So I think if you really feel down, which everyone have done one or the other day in our life, like everyone have gone through it. In fact, um, I just sometimes go even now as well. So it's fine. It's normal. Just think about it. Take a step back and be like, you are the one whom company has selected and they really want you to interview. So just go with that confidence, prepare your answers, write your answers. And even during the interview, if you feel overwhelmed, just take a step back, ask the interviewer that I need two minutes, five minutes, it's fine. But uh, just don't feel underwhelmed or it's like, uh, like I am not the right one for this company. Mm. Yeah, a lot of uh, positive thinking uh, there. Um, and Nikita, again, I think you highlight the fact that you can uh, share how you're feeling. And if you need a few minutes or, uh, you know, break, then uh, you, you're, yeah, you're welcome to um, take that break. The good tip. Uh, Megan? Yeah, so I love what's been added so far. <laughs> I would also just say uh, my on that mindset tip, mindset first, I love music. So like I've got my pump up songs, right? I will reserve 30 minutes before this happens. I will put my music on and I will hype myself up. Um, a couple of other major tips, like as you're going into it, if you're interviewing virtually, turning off all the notifications on your devices, making sure that you have this like mental space that is for you, that is uninterrupted um, and showing up early and making sure that you're testing your equipment. So the worst thing happened, oh my gosh, I've got this pop-up song, I'm so excited, I go on, my headphones aren't connecting, whatever technology they're using isn't what I'm used to, right? So like troubleshooting some of that to make it feel a little bit smoother. And when you're interviewing in person, show it, make sure you're there 30 minutes, don't show up to the office 30 minutes early, go to the, you know, sit in your car or like go to a coffee shop. But I had an experience where like I got a nail in my tire and I was driving with a flat tire to an interview once. And it was the, I got the job, but like I was not, I, I blacked out, right? I don't remember anything that I said in that interview um, because I felt so rushed coming up to it. So like definitely taking that time to say like, what do I need in order to feel calm, to feel present and to focus. Um, 
so those are just kind of some tips and tricks that uh, I would definitely hand down to like come into the moment with clarity. Thank you, Megan. I think my on in on uh, if I'm feeling a bit like tired and uh, just to clear my head, I go I walk barefoot in in my garden, and that really has some sort of like therapeutic. Um, I, I don't know, like it makes a huge difference, and I feel like I get the mental clarity, and I'm ready to take on uh, the world. Uh, they um, they also say hugging the tree helps. Uh, I haven't tried it, but. Yeah, um, that that works for me. Um, thank you, Megan and uh, Mona. Yeah, I think I can uh, agree with that. Like, try and understand yourself a little bit more and see what works for you. Um, it might mean doing a you know breathe in, breathe out meditation. Uh, um, twenty minutes before the interview to calm yourself down. That might work for you. Playing music in your earphones and blasting that, like Megan said, that might work for you. I think some standard things I can think of are get, having a good night's sleep uh, the day before, <laughs> and uh, and making sure you've eaten food. <laughs> like it's a quite basic, but I think it will help to make sure you're not hungry or sleep deprived, and that can have an impact on how you answer some questions. Thank you, Mono. I mean, that back to the basics. Um, I I follow this leader. Um, she's a she teaches. She's called Kara Ronin, and uh, I follow her for leadership uh, tips. And she says, um, you, you know, the confidence if you want it to come from within. She says, just your posture will make a huge difference. Like roll your um shoulders back, and you know, um, and use up the space, and use your hands, and it uh basically you know, makes you look confident and you also feel confident and the conversations then uh, change. I don't know if you noticed, you know, I'm looking a bit more confident now because I've rolled my shoulder, but yeah, if it works, it works. <laughs> just, just Thank you. On. Thank you, everyone. If you don't mind, yeah. Johnny, just coming on, I think that you picked up on a really important point there. Um, so um, the conversation for me is a really important part of an interview, uh, in, in an interview. Process. Be prepared to have a conversation, um, even if the conversation wanes away from the, the topic that may seem uh, not important to you as a candidate. Actually, it may be important to the interviewer. Um, so they may be taking in a direction that they want to take that conversation. So be prepared to have a conversation. So try and stay relaxed and try and avoid that stress response. Because if you if you get into that stress response, it can be very difficult to come out of it. Um, and then you start it, you start answering um, in a way that you may not be wanting to, to represent yourself. So um, it's all about staying relaxed and conversational. That's a, that's an excellent point. And um, this is there's a slight distinction. Um, and I have been actually trying to catch myself. I'm like a headless chicken when I when I panic, right? And then everything is like, yeah, you, you just nothing, nothing goes as per plan after that. You're like headless chicken. Um, but um it's actually at that point, um, trying to like get self-aware. And then breathe, whatever it takes. Like uh, Mona said, understand what works for you. Just uh, breathe. I I just then say, like, take a deep breath and say, okay, right, I'm in the headless chicken mode now. I need to calm down. And once I've actually changed my breathing and calmed down and actually figured that I'm in the headless chicken mode, the interview um actually has changed because some some questions have come my way where I'm like, oh my god, it's uh it's quite challenging. I haven't thought about that. And then it's it's like taking that step back and saying, hey, you know what, I've got this and think calmly and take a few minutes to think over that question and uh, respond calmly. But I think it it comes with self-awareness and I'm still practicing long way, but yeah, still practicing. And, and Thank you. Pro tip, you. always keep a glass of water in a video interview because you can use a glass of water uh, exactly as as a, an intermission point just to collect your thoughts and things. So always have a glass of water on standby. Thank you, Simon. Although I'm um, having it uh, because I'm um, a bit unwell and, and it, it uh, helps with my coughing. <laughs> but I will remember that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my next question is... Um, what is the most effective way a candidate has demonstrated their potential to you in an interview when they lacked direct experience? So this is for like the junior engineers when they are coming in for the interviews. Of course, they don't have the experience, but they have the potential. Now, how, um, you know, how have 
these potential candidates, you know, demonstrated their skills to you, even though they don't have the experience? And what what in your mind, any examples, any things where, you know, people have stood out and said, oh, my God, that 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 was amazing. Um, I'm I welcome all the panelists. Just uh, yeah, go for it. I think one thing that stands out for me, if I feel the candidate doesn't have experience, but I could still be able to, be, I, I, mean, I still feel excited to work with the candidate is if they are able to think out loud and share mm. how, they are, how they are thinking about the problem. And if they can do that, that means that they are uh, also easy to coach and learn from and work with right coach and mentor into becoming uh, um, the engineers that are suited for the job so I think that being honest also really helps at that time so being able to think out loud and but just admitting that you don't know something uh, but this is how you would imagine it can be working or it could be solved in the future like it might be intricacies of a of a programming language and you may not have really deep knowledge in it but you can always suggest that I think this is how you know hash maps work for example right if it's the question around that I've not used it before but um, this is how I think in turn you know the internal implementation works and be able to be okay with not knowing the answer and, and being honest about it I think really stands out. Thank you thank you Mono. Um, Megan? Yeah, uh, I would say going back to like looking at the job description and understanding where your gaps are, I think is really valuable. And it does not mean if you have gaps that it's a negative in the interview. I think to Monal's point, it is identifying opportunities to demonstrate your strengths. Uh, for early career individuals, one, I think most recruiters are very well aware that you're not going to come in and say, I developed this solution that transformed the entire tech stack at this university, right? Like it's, it is, there's a certain level of expectations. So one, I would say for early career, I've worked in two early career programs where we're hiring people fresh out of school. Um, we had a very different, like, tell us how you would actually, to Mona's point, how would you think about this problem? What would, what are the steps you would take to try to find this answer? Because that was more valuable to us and is honestly the most, regardless of the language that you might code in or the tech stack that you know, your ability to learn and think and problem solve is the potential that we're looking for at that stage. Um, so that I think is one of the key things. The other thing I would say is I had somebody uh, who was early career and they were switching out of essentially marketing into data science and they referenced a personal achievement and that was they ran a marathon. And one of the things that they highlighted there was the mindset that it took to put in the training and ultimately overcome all of those like sensations of doubt of like, I can't do it. I'm willing to put my work in and I'm willing to develop a plan the other thing that I found very persuasive from individuals who um, were more early careers, so they've had like five years in the industry, but may not have direct experience is saying, I recognize that this is, you know, whatever topic it might come up is not my strength. This is how I've thought about a learning path for me in the first six months, if I were to get this role. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether or not that's on track. It demonstrates that this person said, hey, I realize this is a gap. I'm dedicated to filling that gap and I want that to be a partnership with my future hiring person. Thank you, Megan. Um, I've um I, I've come across cases where we've asked um uh I've asked in a technical questions and uh they didn't know and they tried to solve it, but then in turn asked me questions and were very curious to know how what is the the correct answer. So um, and and also they have the pattern of asking like loads of questions, their curiosity um, and, and, you know, honesty uh, helps as well. And uh, and when I look at them, I think, you know what, um, whether they have the technical knowledge or not, because right now, it, you know, if from the Internet, you can learn anything. They're asking the right questions and they're curious. So for me, that's uh, that's good enough. So um, I have seen that as well. Nikita, yourself. Yeah. Yep. Um, I have hired multiple new grad folks for Amazon and Uber. Um, I think one thing which stood out for me is like, even though you don't have like full-time experience, because obviously it's a new grad role or entry-level role, 
then also try to focus on things like internships like internships are something which you have done in your curriculum i mean i have done when i used to do my bachelor's or when i was doing my masters i did like two internships so try to focus on internships show your impact add numbers like even though the internships is maybe 3 months 4 months or 6 months long you can show that even though i was working an intern i was given small part of the whole project but this was an impact actually i made it when i was working in as, as an intern and that will make your work impact did in a way that though you were not working as a full time person still as an intern you were able to impact this company in in whatever meaningful way the second thing is lot of people also le- take leverage of their personal project like academic projects mm-hmm. so when you are doing academic projects don't just think of it as like uh in my days kaggle used to be very famous like i used to like really really use kaggle as a data analyst and used to add it in my a resume that i used i have done this kind of analysis using kaggle data so try to also use uh, open source data or in fact anything and add it to your personal project and showcase that saying that okay this was a small project i did it in my academics um whether data structures anything related and this was the outcome of this project so that will show your interest in this that particular topic and it would also show that some or the other way you were also doing hands on you were at least trying like it was not industry experience but that was your personal experience thank you nikita and um uh, it highlights also the transferable skills right so we think we've done something um not not the exactly the same but something similar so um we can look at what we've done that is like a transferable skill that you can bring to the table oh i've actually done something similar in this uh, problem it's not exactly that but um you know and if you can show the transferable skill it is uh, it's very good Lisa Yeah I just wanted to add that um uh, I was doing uh, my internships during university and when I w- was applying for the first uh, new grad position I was also using that like all these projects uh, I actually uh, had a lot to talk about like this 3 months it's uh, so packed and uh, uh, there's a lot of action going on <laughs> and it's also real company so uh i think it's totally a real experience and uh also yeah i just wanted to, uh, to add that the github account also helps like uh, i did my academic projects and even though they were not finished i just added all of them <laughs> to github and it felt like i had a lot of repository so it just feels good <laughs> and sometimes helps thank you and uh and simon Yeah I I think thanks for joining I think you know we're looking to at the same sort of things it's got to, the candidate at this at this level um sort of entry level it's got to be we're looking for things like hard working are they passionate self motivated um are they able to work in a team if they're able to demonstrate these core competencies um the the technical stuff will follow so um the, if you can figure a way of of demonstrating that what where it be through uh, projects that you've done on your own time or open source contributions that you've been making or um really really interesting bits of research that you've been looking into that you've that you want to talk about because they're engaging um that sort of thing is 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 really beneficial for for those early stage interviews thank you um i see hasan uh, divan has actually raised your hand uh, i'd like to say that at the end um we will have time for q and a so we will uh, take your uh, question then or your um whatever you have to say hasan thank you um <clears throat> it was my question. next yeah. it was a question it was a comment at google i do so much i've been kind of at google a long time and i do someone who i clone the entire web app Pretty impressive. We're getting a BS. Okay. I'll be at Stanford. The first five minutes, right? So interviewers often form impressions, and not just interviewers. Anyone, and you know, the first few they they say is it three seconds or seven seconds? I I I can't remember the number, but you know, it's quite uh, important to um you know to have that first impression. So what key thing should candidates focus on focus on the first 5 minutes of the interview to set a positive tone? I will start with Lisa. <laughs> okay, yeah, I have a list of things for myself, I think. Uh firstly, like be on time or even a bit earlier just in case, it's always positive. Then um 
I don't know, like dressing normally and make an adequate like background and stuff, like prepare everything, check your mic and stuff. And then like, just be positive. I'm always trying to smile and like engage. And I think it really helps because people don't know each other and they just uh, judge each other uh, for the first, like uh, when they see each other. And uh, I think it really matters that uh, you set a positive note first. And then you start uh, sharing your knowledge and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Simon. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, um, sorry, Megan. Yeah. <laughs> shall, shall I go, Megan? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think this is a great one because I, I, I think this is probably like the, the most, one of the most important parts. I mean, there's a lot of important parts, but but this is the, the, the first impression is really, really important, certainly for me and, 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 um, I think my biggest tip would be smile, be on time, obviously, smile, that that become and, and find something in the first few seconds that you can relate to the interviewer with straight away. So beyond the interview, this is like, hey, how's your day? The weather's great here. Or I've just been, oh, I've come into the interview and I've got rained on. Make a conversation about it because that demonstrates your confidence. It de demonstrates your social engagement skills. And, and those things are all things that are are, are being assessed in a soft manner. So, um, and, and also maybe even try and control that conversation for the first 15 to 20 seconds. Um, so you just, just appear in control of that conversation. Um, that's probably my biggest tip of the day, to be honest with you. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. So that's definitely yeah. one of my tips is like searching for a commonality. The interviewer might come in with a charm bracelet and you notice they have, they have a family and you also have a family. So you might like use that as the opportunity to kind of build a commonality within the first five minutes. I think to Lisa's points earlier, um, if you're doing a virtual interview, considering your surroundings. So make sure that your ba your background is simple and real. So I by and large prefer the real backgrounds. That's because it minimizes any challenges with your bandwidth because internet is always unreliable. You do not want to be the person who is having that hiccup in the first five minutes. Um, and it is okay. I interviewed during COVID and I was very, I'm here, I'm going to take the blur off. This is also my bedroom. So welcome to my bedroom while we have this interview, right? Just like kind of be recognizing the realness of the situation that you're in. And for in-person, make sure that you've arrived early in addition to the smiling, the posture, the appearance, dressing one level above. If you're interviewing online, throw a suit through something nice on top, wear leggings on bottom, but kind of always dress one level above. Uh, where you think you should. And then once the interviewer starts, make sure that you're making eye contact, not like the creepy, I'm going to stare into your soul kind of eye contact where you don't <laughs> blink, but definitely like make eye contact when they are talking to you, look at them. When you're talking to them, of course, you're probably going to take notes and that like here and there to have a drink of water is fine but make sure that you're actually paying attention to them because it is a conversation with them. Um, and then I think to Simon's point, like listening and leading and having it be a conversation and not immediately launching in to try and prove your worth as much as prove you're human. Because with AI today, they could do all of the coding assessments you're taking home. They could do all of the resumes, all of the LinkedIn profiles, you're here to provide your differentiation as a human. So those are my tips. Thank you. I think the topic of finding um, something common to talk about um, is, is quite interesting. We'll probably, you know, um, discuss a little bit uh, at the end, Megan, because it's uh, I, I love that love that topic of how you can figure out in an interview, just seeing like, how do you figure out what, what is common? But we'll take yeah. that um, at the end. Uh, Nikita, yeah. Yeah, Um. I think one quick thing is like just to break the ice and to find something common, you can actually check out the LinkedIn profile of the person before actually going into the interview process. Uh, and in fact, send them a small message. I used to do that and used to help to break the ice because the person will actually also look at your profile. So if you're doing this thing, please make sure your profile is updated and just send a message saying that, hey, great to meet you. We are having an interview coming up. I would love to connect and just take five, 10 minutes to go through the profile in detail, learn about the projects they are doing, um, anything common like 
uh, as what been mentioned and try to just start on on the topic of like hey i saw that you are doing this in ai space this is like an upcoming topic i uh, would like to connect so that will actually help you to also ca calm down a little bit because going in interviews are always a pressure and those kind of conversation will break the ice and start from there Thank you, uh, Nikita. That's a it's a very good uh, uh, you know pro tip. Everyone, um, yeah, go and find out who is interviewing you and figure out uh, if they if they have LinkedIn presence. Uh, yeah, yeah, get get to know them a little bit. Thank you for that. Um, have I covered Mono? Yeah, I think really good points. Um, all I can think of at this point is make sure that you if you're it's a remote interview, there's a uh, light. So you are, you know, lighter on you so mm. that your face is clear and your video is, is, is um, very, very sharp. Um, and I think don't take it from a dark place. Obviously, log in a few minutes before always helps and test your mic. So I think having, making sure that your audio is going through clearly is very important as well. And I think these make a first impression and you know, prevent all the hiccups, so to start with, um, and it sets off on a good tone. You don't waste any time um, doing that. So being prepared in every way possible before it can always help make those five minutes nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope uh, the audience has taken uh, some notes there. Um, now, the power of questions, right? Um, I think it it depends. Like when you're junior, you're almost like you're really being interviewed. You're like being questioned. Whereas when you start, um, you know, going up the seniority, then you actually learn learn to ask questions because it's equally you want to see that the company is fit. And this I've seen this transition in myself as well. However, even though you're junior, I think that I've had some really great questions from like uh the junior engineers in in an interview which uh which i've been very impressed so my question is on the topic like what was the most memorable question you've been asked by a candidate during an interview and why did it stand out so if you if you can't remember the exact question but what are the things that could possibly stand out when you're asking questions so what sort of questions would be really nice for the candidates to ask the interviewer I can share a long, yeah, long yeah. list. Uh, yeah, um, as a recruiter, I, if you're talking for the first time, in fact, uh, to the hiring manager, first of all, ask for the salary range, because I think this is like a common problem I've seen with the candidates happening again and again. Uh, that they got they get low balled um when they complete the offer stage, and they don't even know what is the range they can expect. The second thing is, um, as I mentioned, ask the recruiters to send you the information like what is expectations because then you can prepare accordingly and then the timeline because ghosting is one of the most important or the common things happens um, like in the interview stages so if you know the timeline what is to expected as like the next steps uh, what is the overall like are they looking to hire someone in next one month two months or whatever and um, what is the expectations are at they are actually expecting from the candidate so that it's easier for you to brainstorm and come to a conclusion whether you as a candidate will fit in for the role or not. Thank you, Nikita. Um, Megan? Yeah, so I will say as a hiring manager, so they've gone through the recruiter conversations and HR conversations and covered off on a lot of what Nikita mentioned. Um, one of the me most memorable and worst ones was somebody diving into benefits and salary with me, uh, which I was not there for that conversation, right? Um, I was there to talk about skills and interest. And so that for me is a turnoff. So really to that former point, understanding where in the process it is. And also there's a lot of the nuance that you might have questions for that you can always use as negotiating points once the company sold on you after your amazing interview. Um, one of the questions that really stood out to me positively and actually kind of caught me off guard after we were discussing like a current project, what onboarding to that project and the particular problems to be solved were, was somebody asked that, what, that one of the candidates asked like something along the lines of, well, what's next? uh essentially to the point of well once we solve this problem what's the next big one and how does this fit into like the bigger overall context right why does this 
project and this position matter. And I really liked that. It was somebody early in their career because it showed like they were looking at this, not as the problem to be solved, but as a series of problems to be solved um, and gave me really a lot of positive kind of impression in terms of how they're going to think about their work that's being done. So that's one that really stood out for me. Thank you, Megan. I think uh, it highlights the, um, you know, um, the skill of someone junior, but still can see the big picture, right? It's a big picture view and, um, and, and that's a, that's a good one. So if you can ask your interviewers any big picture questions, yeah, it'll be a great one. Um, I'm happy. Simon, do you want to go next? Yeah, yeah, I can do. Um, I, I have a couple, but I mean, there's one that springs to mind that really ca caught me off guard, actually. It was um, it was a, an interview for a fairly, um, fairly deep core technical technical role. And uh, the, the JD was um, fairly uh, prescriptive in, in what we were looking for um, and um, through screening. So I think it was I think it was final round. So it was assumed to be fairly, fairly, um, you know, close to the close to the end. And um, but the we were challenged. I was challenged with why we hadn't done something technically um that a research paper um mm. had uh shown to to be a, a successful way of doing something and this caught me off guard one because um it was putting it back on on me as the interviewer and I was I had to think and I I interestingly we 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 had of course done the research and we knew the research paper in question it was an I, if you're, you're interested it was a it was a Netflix study on on uh key uh key distribution um uh, hashing algorithms and key distribution it was it's quite an interesting paper and um we we'd taken that research work and we'd slightly evolved it and changed it slightly for our a nuanced it for our particular um use case um but what that demonstrated to me was that this person really really knew what they'd done they knew, really knew what they were they, they were talking about they'd done the research and they had a really good technical understanding of something and it it, it challenged me and to and and that took the the conversation in a different direct direction and uh we did go on to to hire that candidate actually oh wow well, well, yeah, very good point. Very good point. So research, uh, like understand what the company is solving and see what other parallel systems are there and try and compare. And again, it comes down to the big picture view, isn't it? You're saying, oh, why are they using the solution versus there's another solution that we could have used. Yeah, good, good, good one, um, uh, Simon. Mono? I think a memorable one for me was when a junior engineer asked me, what were the top three actions in your last retrospective and how are you planning to solve them? I thought that was really smart. Great question. Was really good one. Yeah, I, I mean, people, are you taking notes? <laughs> that is a really good one, yeah. I thought yeah, it, was, so, it, it stayed yeah. with me because I thought that, and we did hire the candidate because I think it's important for you to understand what are the challenges in the team and what is the team thinking about it in, in their retros? And um, a really good question to ask an engineering manager. Amazing. I think, um, I don't know if this is the right or the wrong uh, way, um, but uh, in my interview, I did ask um, uh, the the employee, the engineer, like what are what, what is what is great about the company? And what are the improvements uh, um, that they, he would like, or you know, to put forth for the company? If he had to change it, what would he change? So that gives me an insight on what are the problems, right? You you only not see the good, um, good side of things, but you can also probe into like what else is uh, is going on, right? Um, Lisa. Yeah, I just wanted to add that it's really important to ask questions because I remember myself on my first interview when uh, I didn't know that it's like I need to ask questions in the end of the interview. Otherwise, like I'm not interested in stuff. And uh, it was a technical interview and uh, the interviewer in the end, uh, he asked like, do you have any questions for me? And I was like, not really, <laughs> because I thought it's a technical interview. What should I ask? <laughs> I already solved the the the, the challenge. So yeah. <laughs> and then I realized like it was really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it shows what um how much you're interested in the company and how much you're, you know, your passion and what why and and that you truly want to join the company, right? Because that's when you're thinking about these these things. Uh, and you and you're considering it seriously. And it's not just like another company that you're just uh, interviewing. So yeah, good one. 
I think we we are um, at, at the close and I would ask one final question. What is the ultimate pro tip that, you know, the panelists can give to the, uh, the audience who uh, want to interview? I'm happy for anyone to go uh, go first, negotiate it, uh, panelists. <laughs> yeah. To ace, ace the interview, I think, is just getting prep, right? The first interview is going to be uncomfortable, practicing the behavioral questions we didn't get to talk that much about, but starting to rehearse those. We've talked a lot about writing down what your answers would be. But understanding what your inflection is and how you respond to questions and who you actually are when you come off mute is one of the big selling points, right? It's how you're creating this connection with the interviewer during that. Um, and you really, you want to get the answers right and do the prep of like, what's the story that fits this particular case well or can demonstrate my experience. But then getting, call somebody up here, do the mock interviews and actually talk through it because it is a muscle. And it is, it's one of the things I always recommend people you, later on in their career interview and apply for, well, apply and interview at one job a year, because it is a muscle and it is intimidating no matter how badass you are is, but if you haven't done it, just get out there and practice, make it a routine. Yeah. I, I know of uh, someone who um, actually does that like every six months, just to interviews um, just to keep the whole like to to see what is the market looking like and um, if there's anything, um, you know, just keeping on top of their resume and having to go through this means they are, uh, you know, they're not rusty. Right. When when the real interview happens and they are uh, they are prepared. So I know of someone who is really good with this and I'm sure in their lifetime, they would have probably done like at least 60 interviews, but hey ho, um, some of us, it's it's overkill, but uh, I, I think um, it's, it's something we can learn, just interview and, and keep at it. Um, yeah, Nikita? Yeah, I think the pro tip from my end is, um, like you mentioned about feeling overwhelmed or just feeling less confidence. Um, I think in that perspective, just focus on knowing that you are, you have done your 100%, you're preparing, you are actually adding value, you are right fit for this role. Uh, just don't try to use LinkedIn a lot when you are interviewing. And the reason why I'm saying this, because a lot of people do start sharing about like uh, post around, they got an opportunity. And if they are within your network, then sometimes you start feeling overwhelmed or be like, okay, this person has got already a job. I'm still interviewing. Multiple things start going through your mind. So when you're interviewing, try to just uh, see that what is your journey, what is your focus, and you are the right fit for this role. And even if you don't land that jo job or the interview, just move on. Like, just don't keep on thinking that no, um, it's like really bad. I, I was not preparing or things like that. Just focus and move on and start preparing a little bit more and work on your weakness. Thank you. Um, Mono, Simon, Lisa. I think my, my, my pro tip would be get good at understanding what your strengths are and focus on those in the interview because that's where you stand out and that's what the you know the interviewer will remember you for so focus on your strengths um technically professional i mean personally as well as a person as well what are you good at and try and show that yeah i think from 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 my side um don't don't dwell if 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 you get a rejection that's tr treat it as a learning opportunity um try and reach out if you can um and and ask for feedback from that interview process um oftentimes companies will be prepared to do that um especially if they're engaged um in that tna process and and um in, sort of digest that that feedback and on and reflect on it and, and a good ref way of reflecting on it is discussing it with a peer so um take that feedback and have open kind of discussions with a peer that's not part of the process um so you can have a conversation about that because that sometimes helps with self-learning um and don't be downbeat because um you know you, there's there's another interview around the corner um and just because you you haven't got that one doesn't mean there's another one the fact that you've you've been through that interview process is a is a is a is a is a, is a great indictment on your skills so thank you simon i think um you, you make a very good point um if, if if you if we change our um 
you know, thinking process to say, hey, you know, fa failures happen, but great, the failure happened. And you look at it positively, you just program your mind, reframe um, your brain to look at failures very positively, even in the shittiest of um, situations you can actually look at, um, you, you know, look at it as a learning um, opportunity to say, okay, this has happened. What, like you said, get the feedback, work on it. And it's a skill, like everyone has uh, their own uh, strength and, and skills and you just build your skills and you get better. And the more interviews you do, the more comfortable you will, you will get. And yeah, uh, thank you, Simon, for that. Lisa? Yeah, I think a helpful tip would be uh, state of mind when you think that the interview is not a monologue it's a dialogue and uh, ideally the interviewer is your friend and you're both keen on knowing each other and it's not only the company who's choosing you and you are also choosing the company and you're like equally uh, just uh, keen on doing something together for an hour and uh, it's not like a fight it's more of a just um knowledge share something like that <laughs> yeah uh, look, very good one very good one yeah um and if you you actually like the interviewers always think that the interviewers are set, setting you up for success rather than failure and if you go with that mode i think um anything you know that crop crops up you will you basically will ignore and 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 then look at everything um and keep the interview positive that was an excellent, uh, excellent point, Lisa. So thank you very much. I'm going to open the um, uh, floor for questions. My awesome, wonderful uh, co-host, Julia, is going to be um, yeah, uh, taking care of that. Uh, there you go, Julia. But before we end, um, I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for being here, the panelists and also the audience. And I absolutely loved hearing everyone's perspective and um, I hope the audience uh, also felt, felt the same thing. So thank you so much for being here, taking the time out and uh, being there for uh, our, our candidates. Thank you. Julia, um, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna crack on with some of the questions. So they start coming in. Uh, please feel free guys to post more questions as we do still have some time. So um, uh, a question Sophia is asking. So what are your tips for answering the classic, what's your biggest weakness? So yeah, a controversial one. So how would you answer that one? I think the I can I can start and give it a try. Um, the best way to answer this is to find something that can be turned into a weakness, um, and can present itself as something that you can you can say how you are also working on improving it, and does not feel like um it is. Like I'm trying to think of an example here to explain, but you may wanna you may wanna think through something that you've got feedback on in your performance reviews in the past. It might be something like, I don't speak enough in, um, in meetings and and that ha is one of my weaknesses. But I'm working on doing more public speaking while giving presentations at these forums. So something that immediately turns the conversation in your favor or shows that you're working on something can help. That's one way I, I can think of tackling that question. Yeah, I'll chime in and just say, it's actually one of my favorite questions to ask as an interviewer between the weakness and tell me about a time that you failed. Um, to me, what I am looking for is self-awareness. We are all human, we have all made mistakes, we will all fail, we are all imperfect. And if somebody cannot fess up to that, that, con that concerns me significantly. And I think to Mono's point, it is really identifying what was a learning opportunity in some of your weaknesses, right? So one of mine is, I tend to get over invested in projects. And as a result of that, I can do that thing where I bring my head and I end up working late hours when in reality, what I need to do is actually just step away. And so one of the things that I've learned throughout this is that I need to insert breaks into my schedule. So I'm very strict of logging off at five o'clock. Even if I'm stuck on a project, 
to go walk the dog and I come back. And that has really helped both with my work-life balance as well as with my ability to like quickly solve the problem at hand. So identifying one of those pieces of weaknesses and then providing like, this is how I'm currently working through it is really, it provides that self-awareness along with like that typical plan that you might put forth to improve on something. Yeah, I I I, I um second what Megan said there. I think um typically these these sort of questions should you should try and use them as a way to highlight some of your innate strengths. So you could potentially um draw upon experience where something went wrong and a failure happened, um, a technical failure, for example, but technical weakness or something that, that fell through. But then how did you demonstrate getting past that? And that that then can show your your innate uh, human aspects. So try and draw draw attention to the fact that you use some of your core human competence to overcome some potential technical challenge or technical flaw. Um, that, that's probably what I'd say. Excellent. Any other thoughts? All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. So next question is from Tia. Um, and um, I guess it's a little bit uh, more of a technical one, but I'll give it um, give it a shout. So um, do you actually ask about algorithms and or use lead code hacker rank can you introduce or are those just meant more as a way of practicing? I'll, I, I can start by answering that. We we absolutely do. So um, there'll there'll be um, questions designed to to just affirm your competence with fairly fundamental computer science um, aspects, and so that will look into data data structures, algorithms, some comprehension of Big O, and and time complexity and things like that. Um, but these are stuff that you should be able to to revise for, and um, you know, there's, there's resources out there that will will help you revise for that stuff. Um, but absolutely, yeah, we'll we'll be asking those questions, and and they will be required to pass through the phases to the later phase of the interview. I also want to add that uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to be using lead code to practice the technical interview rounds. Um, in our in in uh, in in the companies, um, I have seen that they use uh, lead code and Quidility, and I I can't remember the third one, but they use very similar platforms. So I would say a, a, any number of practice you get on lead code, um, Quidility sort of uh, platforms, uh, that's great. I also wanted to add that um, companies like Google or Facebook, Meta, whatever, uh, they're basically like lead code uh, itself is built from the uh, questions uh, these companies asked. So basically people just go from the interviews and post their tasks there. So it's like the other way around. <laughs> it was really helpful for the candidates. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope, Tia, this was helpful. And I'm going to move on to the next one. So Salmaz is a recent bootcamp graduate and was wondering what are the computer science theoretical skills uh, that you would recommend to brush up on before the interviews? Just your basic, uh, which collection you'd use. And is it, didn't we use hash tables with lists and maps and lists and sets are not used in the, in the real world. Maps are more used. You know, just know why. Things like that. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Lisa, uh, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I think um, basically lead code has everything inside it uh, and it's really um, useful to um, go through like the sections it has uh, for example uh, with different algorithm like recursions or uh, arrays strings or some advanced stuff like uh, trees or uh, some sorting algorithm like it's all already uh, sectioned there and it's really um useful for me at least uh, to just go through it but uh 
just think about the time because it's really a lot of things and yeah thanks Solmas uh, for listing it out like it's still a lot of things to brush out <laughs> Simon do you want to add uh, something to this uh, no, I was just I was just smiling because uh, someone else just uh, pasted something in the chat, which is a fairly fairly. I'm just looking. Yeah, I mean it's a fairly fairly good set there um, of 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 concepts and and structures that you'll you'll want to have a handle on, um, and probably just a slight sort of taking it one step further, um, potentially understand. Um, not only what the data structures are, but perhaps understand where they where they're applicable, um, and potentially understand the slight, you know, the 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 big O for some of those different algorithms and things and sort sort techniques. Um, that that will help at a fundamental level. Um, but no, that's a, that's a good list. That's great. Um, thank you. So Kate, she's a self-learned developer and she was wondering what are your tips for uh, breaking into the industry if there is no industry experience? Open source contributions always help. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, I can add that for sure. Open source, then on top of it, freelancing work. Um, other than that, internships. And you can even go to the websites like Upwork for freelancing projects. You can go and check out startups like from websites like angel list y combinator even tech stars startups who recently got funded you can reach out to the founders of the company and be like hey i'm looking for freelancing work or i'm looking for part-time jobs i'm looking for personal projects and in terms of helping the company grow and that ways you can actually build your experience if you are really going out and not having like proper industry experiences and you can put it in your profile and showcase that Excellent. I, Thank you. I just had a, um, a tip. So one of the things I find works well if you're trying to break into the tech to uh, see how it can be a mutual benefit to both companies. So like uh, a small company go and say, hey, you know what? I will, um, you know, for a very, very salary and for um, a short time, why don't you try me for three months? right? And if it doesn't work, then we part ways and it's no one uh, else's loss. Um, but, you know, try and negotiate um, with the company if uh, if you if you can to see, um, yeah, if you really can find um, a way to break into tech and find, um, and I have known of uh, engineers who've done that, who completely come from different, uh, you know, background, non-computing uh, backgrounds, uh, but uh, have actually uh, worked with you know she said hey you know what um I, I'm actually very curious and because I've done this uh thing I know all about this um I know I don't have that uh, uh the background that you're expecting but give give me you know give me three months to prove myself and I think there are some companies willing um to you know take a chance and um uh, yeah, give you that opportunity. So try and see if there's any such offers you can make and um and to break break into tech because once you've like, you know, stepped in in that direction after that because you're already doing self learning, it shows that you're motivated and and nothing is going to stop you. Excellent, thank you. So how about tips for people who are changing their careers and they're going for the interview, which is for the change. Um, well, there there are skills that transfer across jobs. So, for example, if I were, I'm a computer science major from Stanford, et cetera, et cetera, but I may want to apply for a job as a psychologist. And skills that transfer across the job would be, I can manage people. But people's skills are very important in every job. Um, other things like that, I'm not sure. I've done a job as a psychologist, but if I wanted to, I would present people's skills, how I get along with people, how I'm able to manage team, et cetera, et cetera. Things like that. I'm not sure I caught that, uh, Devon, yeah. but I will open, yeah, open the yeah. question to the panelists, yeah. Yeah, um, I think I can quickly add. Uh, so there are transferable skills. I think what's, uh, what was Devon mentioning about, like if you are a career changer, like I've done career, I've changed my career twice. So whenever I was changing a career, definitely there are a few things which you are going to bring in from your last career. 
um and you need to also understand that okay how my last skills set whom i am transferring from x role to y role how or which of those skill set can i bring in and then you can obviously put them first and say that okay in my last role i was doing these these skills or this was my job now in my next role why first of all you have to have a story or a reason that why you are targeting a new role because if you don't know the reason then people will keep on asking you why you are looking for a change and then on top of it you need to also start justifying that how your last role can actually help you to move this transition from x role to y role and that's where i think uh, transfer of skills are really really important yeah uh, thank you nikita i can i can uh, um i i know a lady who was working in the police and uh, found a job and uh she, with sheer transfer skills she was able to convince the company that uh, she can she can find a job i also wanted to add that there are some intensive courses on changing the profession and uh, uh there tend to help uh do at least one diploma project or something like that uh so that you can uh put it in your resume and then there also trying to help you find a job or at least like uh, do um, a research or uh, brush up your resume or something like that so that you are fully prepared for changing the profession. And also volunteer at Women Who Code, right? Um, so if you, um, if you want to break into tech, as you're volunteering, you actually learn a lot. And all of these skills um, really help because you're attending events, learning what's what's going on, and uh, it gives you the confidence to say, "Hey, you know what? I'm I'm ready for this uh, this role as well." So uh, please come and volunteer uh, for us at uh, Women Who Code London. I would I would also <laughs> just say just what, add, add one thing on the transferring. Um, it's probably also good to have some kind of sponsor or contact within the industry you're transferring to um, so you can um, get a real understanding of what the the, the challenges are and, and the competent the, the core competencies, competencies that will be required. Um, and you can also use them as a sounding board um, to 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 help get you um, get you in the right place. Yeah, I'll echo the, the networking piece is huge. Um, and that's why like women who code, right? These communities are where you start to build those networks to get those ends, to get more insight, um, to help you prepare. And that is so critical as well for the success of like your hiring pipeline. So from application to interview as well. Yeah, um, I can just add one quick thing, Julia. Uh, it just came to my mind because Rajni mentioned about police officer or folk, someone from a police background getting a job in a tech company. So this is, uh, this happens because when you f actually figure out that this is that the role you want to target in a tech company or any other organization uh, based on your last role. And for that, I can just share one thing that try to also understand that what all path other people are taking when they're moving from this role to some other role. So you can go to LinkedIn, you can type in, for example, the title, um, police officer and maybe try to go through the profiles of the people who have been ex-police officers and try to learn from their career path that now what all jobs they have been doing and then try to understand those roles, deep dive about the job descriptions, maybe even have coffee chats with them and then make a decision that whether you're looking for this path or some other path and then maybe you can start your journey. Excellent. These are some really great advices. Thank you. Um, so uh, when it comes to standing out from the crowd, so Nimra was wondering um, how to uh, even get to the interview stage, because it seems like quite a bit of people have experience of just continuous apl applications and never ending. So what is that key recipe? How to stand out? <laughs> how to get noticed? You need to attend meetup groups in person, meet people there. Or go to bar, nearby bars where it particularly helps to meet people there at, at places where people will socialize, socialize. Ask them for a job directly. Just say, hey, you're at Vodafone or Vodafone. Can you give me an in? And then it works out. It'd be good. If not, well, move on to the next person, I suppose. I mean, anyone else want to start? I am happy to share this because this is something I've been doing from last few years. But if anyone else want to add in something before me. 
go for it um i think one thing which obviously going to stand out is you're working on your resume your linkedin profile you are networking in the right way you're sending professional messages um being a recruiter i get messages like hi nikita hello nikita can you get me a job so avoid these type of messages which is not going to help you in any, any of these cases uh, try to find out people who are hiring and on top of it before you actually start reaching out or start doing networking like for example we have close to 50 people in this space if you're reaching out to me while we are already having a conversation you can just send me a message hey nikita i saw or i heard you in this particular event this is my profile would like to connect with you so that will actually make you stand out and if i even looking at your profile and if your profile is not completed it's not five star uh, then definitely the chances are pretty high that you're missing an opportunity of connecting with that person so try to do your homework before you start networking work on your like additionally everything have your handy your resume prepared uh everything in your profile should have the keywords uh, because i think someone was asking the question about getting auto generated rejections so if you are getting it obviously your resume is not picking up it's not matching with the job description so these are the few tips i mean i can go on and on but happy to pass it to my to other folks yeah i agree 100% it is doing that analysis take all the job descriptions throw it into all those little items into an into an excel spreadsheet or a sheets of some sort throw all of your experience in there, throw your resume in there, make sure that you're lining up and you're getting those keywords into your resume. Um, I, LinkedIn is really huge. If you are just connecting with people without sending a message, that's not going to be effective. If you're just saying hello, that's also not going to be effective. This is your opportunity to show that you are a person. LinkedIn messages are kind of like the new cover letter, but cover letters are also important. So make sure that you're also working on those. Um, and the resume itself does not need to be fancy. Most of the stuff is actually auto uh, filtered out. That's why you get auto generated rejections. People don't really care about how fancy and what cool font you've got. So again, it's the content that's in that resume that's gonna get you kind of through that next step to talk to somebody like a recruiter on the line. Um, and again, networking as well. So leveraging the communities, leveraging, um, like if you've, applied. I've had tons of people reach out to me and say, Hey, I applied to this role at Capital One. I see that you're there now. Like, do you mind telling me a little bit more about it? Would you be interested in giving me a referral? So like I can do an internal referral and that can like jump the resume as long as it passes kind of the key criteria. So absolutely 100% um, on everything that has been said before, but uh, that is, there's a lot of work that goes in there and it is worth it. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Um, I have another interesting question from Eva. So she's wondering about the red flag. So how to prepare for your next interview to avoid the red flags that potentially um, you've picked up on your previous role uh, or the company? And I guess it sort of goes down also to the question. So what are the key things to look out for? So to apply for a good company from your experience? I'll jump in there. From a red flags perspective, I think it's absolutely critical you understand what contribution you had to the red flags and what contributions the company had to the red flags and where that locus of control is. For example, people say, I felt burnt out because I, I got too much work. And so I want to really understand work-life balance. You get into another role and look out, you're burnt out again because the issue is more about your ability to say no and appropriately prioritize the work. So that is like one thing I really want to caution against is like, Nobody's really going to be honest about work-life balance because work-life balance is truly on you to set your priorities. That being said, Simon, I think, had touched on values of the company, doing your research, understanding what's out there, and then asking some of those questions in the interview. Is what the interviewer match saying matching up to what may have attracted you to the company based on their stated values on the internet? Um, do they align with your core values? Um, and... So like, those are, I would say my, my two big ones. I definitely want to open it up to other people on the panel of, you know, figuring out the red flags and how to avoid them. Are these red flags about the 
company and predicting them or are they this is more quite... about as I understood from the question of um when you interview how to ensure that you're able to pick up on any red flags which let's say you would not want to given you some of your past experiences yeah I would say make a list of what you are looking for in your next job and ask questions around that so for example at this at a certain stage in your career you may be looking for a particular type of manager who could be a mentor to you to progress in a certain area or like in a in a specialization you know in tech um and you're looking for you know seeing making sure that your manager can mentor you into into growing in that space because you've not had the chance to get a manager like that and that could be very important so like write that down and then make sure when you are interviewing with the company you are asking questions that help you answer those because i truly believe an interview is a two way conversation and as much as they are interviewing you you should also be interviewing your company so if you know what you are looking for then you can ask the questions and you know make sure that there are no red flags on your top criteria while looking for the move no that excellent that makes perfect sense thank you any other thoughts all right so another interesting for you so what are your tips on a good LinkedIn profile? So what is that that's worth sort of focusing on? What's worth to bring out? And I guess especially that um, might be a, a interesting question for people who are changing careers and they need to somehow to elevate maybe not as much experience. I can jump in for the LinkedIn profile. Uh, so like, as I mentioned, start working on your LinkedIn profile from top to bottom. So as a recruiter, we use LinkedIn recruiter if people don't know about it to find candidates. And when we use candidates, we use Boolean keywords. I don't know if everyone knows what is Boolean keywords, but Boolean keywords are the keywords present in the job description. So if you don't know those keywords, you can go through the job description again and again, try to understand there. Obviously, if you're applying for similar roles, um, of there will be common keywords, for example, front end engineering will require React, JavaScript, and multiple tech stack, which are going to be common in those areas. So you need to work on your profile, including those keywords. Um, it starts from your profile photo to your cover photo to your headline to your summary section. In your headline, if you're writing things like open to work, you're wasting your space because open to work is not a keyword. If you're writing those things in your um, experience section, I've seen people just adding the title and the company, nothing is blank. So try to add as much information as you can and consider your LinkedIn as a bigger version of your resume. So whatever you're writing in your resume, you can add as many things as you can in your resume, uh, in your LinkedIn profile and try to balance or compare both. They should resonate because if you're writing something else in your resume and something else in your LinkedIn profile as a recruiter, it's going to confuse me. So try to focus and just replicate both the things and both goes hand in hand. I have one more question, um, Julia. You, you, I saw that you, uh, you're asking for more questions. So one question is, it's um, once you've done the interview and if you've had candidates that were sitting on the, you, you know, like you weren't sure, but what actions did they take to make sure that they land the job, right? Because, uh, you know, there are several candidates competing and um, you are almost thinking, yeah, I'm not sure of this candidate, but something after the interview that the candidate's email has um, actually changed your mind about the candidate and say, okay, he may be, you know, we'll probably consider him. So is there anything the panelists can add um, after after the interview is done, anything proactive that uh, the candidate could do to get the job? I'll, I'll jump in on, on this one, Rajani, just, for, just from my point of view. Um, so invariably, um, a decision hasn't been made when the interview interview door closes um th there will be a reflection period by the interviewer and that will typically go to a a team roundtable as well where they'll discuss the candidates and they'll discuss relative 
um, feedback of, from that each each interviewer has has taken. And so there's <clears throat> there's an interview in, intervening period before before decisions are made. Um, a follow up email, in in my opinion, really helps. Um, a sh show some courtesy. So say thank you. It was great. Th thank you to to have this opportunity to interview for you. I found the 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 process really engaging. This is why I thought the company this really sort of um, you know, I could relate to some of these points from the interview process and potentially list some of the points that you related to. Um, and it, it's courtesy and it, it goes a long way, um, typically. Um, so yeah, I, I think that would be a bit of advice for me. Yeah, I will totally add on to that. Following up with an email, touching on that personal note that you identified early on in the interview um, and highlighting something specific from the conversation, not just regurgitating your interest in the role, but really kind of touching on I found this problem that we were discussing particularly interesting and I look forward to, you know, the opportunity to work on it in the future. Um, I would say as soon as you can within no longer than 24 hours, I've gotten, I think, you know, a week later, I'm like, obviously this was not a priority for you. So I think there's also a little bit of time sensitivity. Um, there have been situations where our emails have been masked to our interviewees. So they have not been able to actually email us. In which case they've emailed the recruiter to and asked to forward it on to the individual. So if you don't have that, and if you're on a big panel interview, you might not have everybody's email or connect with them on LinkedIn and send them a message again. Um, it could just be trying to message them on LinkedIn, right? You don't have to necessarily connect, but doing some type of personal follow-up with everybody that you talk to, um, talk to is definitely a standout move. You can always ask the person to talk to an email address at the end. Like you can ask me or the I sent up with your email address and thank you and I'll give it to you, no problem. But if you ask me, I wonder what you want. So be be open and be direct about what you want and I'll give it to you, no problem. Cheers. Do we have any more questions, Julia? I don't see any more questions coming in. I do hope that I managed to capture all of them. There have been quite a bit, but I don't see any others unless someone can be super quick and type the next one. <laughs> right, and indeed there are some good, uh, quick typers. So what would be the best advice for someone who has a gap of inactivity in the last couple of months or so? I would How say, would that, uh, I, I would say, why you have a gap in activity, uh, gap activity. It's not, um, there's no universal answers question. It's just, why do you have a gap in activity? Were you traveling? Were you taking home uh, as a child? Were you taking care of a sick pet? Were you taking care of a parent? So that's the reason you have an activity gap. Explain that, be honest about it, and it'll be fine. Hmm. Monald, do you want to share something? Yeah, as well? sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, um, essentially have a have a meaningful story around the inactivity, and I don't think that's a problem at all these days. Um, as long as you can explain what you were, um, you know, you you were doing, it could also be essentially taking a bit of a break. You know, traveling. You know, it could be a parental break um could be lots of different reasons right so um be able being able to explain that and um that should be enough oh, i saw I something also... oh, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on, i was just gonna on. say i would also check the privacy and the protection laws that you have the right to depending on the country and and particular municipality that you live in there are certain questions that are off limits within the US that people do not have the right to ask you, um, particularly around disability status. So if there is a reason that you've taken time off for a disability, make sure that you understand like in, in some circumstances, you don't have to answer that question. You can say, thank you for your curiosity. I would like I, that, but that is not part of this conversation. So I just wanna make sure that people are aware that there are differences in what is protected for some of those um, more personal um, leaves, um, include pregnancy in some countries is covered as one of those as well. Um, so I just wanna 
job it. I, I love Monal's suggestion. That's exactly it, right? Being able to say, I decided to take a step back to focus on my family, to refresh, to, in academia, people take sabbaticals all the time, right? Like it is not a, something that is frowned upon, but demonstrating that human element, right, is, is key. And I think um, if you're on, honest about it and um, yeah, you yeah, own it, then um, I don't think companies usually have a have a problem with it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Any other All questions? Right. All right. It seems like we're exhausted <laughs> the <laughs> questions at this point. So thank you all for your great questions. I feel like they contributed greatly to extend the discussion. So thank you so much. That's a good, very good point, Megan, uh, regarding the last issues replying uh, regarding the last uh, question. A good one. Yeah, so thank you everyone and uh, for all the, uh, the the brilliant questions. Like Julia said, thank you, Julia, for doing this on. I could have not done it without you, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> <laughs> on my phone, I could either see the audience, you know, the panelists and the audience or, yeah. Uh, so thank you uh, for this. And uh, thank you again uh, to all the panelists, uh, Irina and uh, the audience for uh, being there today. I hope, uh, uh, you know, the panelists enjoy as well as the audience enjoyed. I had uh, an amazing, uh, amazing time and I can't thank you enough for being here and giving your valuable time. Each one of you contributed um, to the questions in your own, uh, you know, diverse perspectives, which I am, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm blown away uh, by. And I have learned quite a few as well. So uh, from your uh, yeah, responses. So thank you very much, everyone. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You so much.